On Monday, uh, Carrie, my wife, and I celebrated our 24th wedding anniversary. And I thought it would be kind of fun to show you a picture of our wedding day. So here's a, here's a picture of us uh, 24 years ago. You don't have to laugh that much, Murray. <laughs> Uh, we got married in Beaverdam, Wisconsin. It was a very hot summer July day. Uh, there was no air conditioning in the church that we got married in. And so being that I was in a full suit, like many grooms are, I was sweating a lot. That's what I do remember. And as I, I look at this picture and, and as I, I look at that uh, early 20-something uh, in the picture, I think back to what I was thinking on that day. And when it comes to married life, I will say this, that 24 years later, I've realized that um, I had a lot to learn. And the, the truth is that I underestimated the joy and blessing that marriage can be. Like, until you experience it, to, to know that you can go through life with someone and they've got your back and they're going to be there for you. And then in my case, and for many of you listening, um, I also have the benefit of a, a spouse that has the same faith in Jesus that I do. Like, um, it's amazing the blessing that there is in marriage. But there's something else that's true, too. <laughs> I also underestimated the amount of work it would be to have a healthy marriage, a healthy relationship. Like, I loved her. I was attracted to her. It's all going to just work out fine, right? It's easy. Yeah, not so much. When you spend every single day with someone, I don't care who it is, when you spend every single day with someone, there's a fairly good chance that things aren't going to always be perfect every day. There's a fairly good chance that you're going to get frustrated with that person, even if you love them, that there's going to be conflict with each other. And um, yeah, that, that's happened, I think, once or twice over <laughs> 24 years. And I'd, I'd like to stand here and say that it's all been Carrie's fault. Uh, and I didn't, I, I'd like to say that, but I would, I would be lying to you. And of all the things that I've learned over 24 years, as I look at that early 20-something in that picture, if you can go back to it, I think the, the thing that I, I, I've, I've come to realize is one of the things I've learned is I've learned a lot about myself. Marriage has a way of putting a magnifying glass on you. And I've learned what my strengths are, and I've also learned my weaknesses. In the context of marriage, I've discovered that where my sinful tendencies are and things that I need to, to tweak in my life. And, and I hope that if Carrie was up here on the stage with me, that she would say that I've grown since that picture. But what I know she would say, and I would too, is that even today, 24 years later, um, I'm still a work in progress. Can you relate to any of that? It doesn't have to be a context of marriage, uh, but maybe this question gets at the heart of it. Are, are there ways that you need to grow? Like, I can't imagine someone today saying no to that question. No, I got this life thing all figured out. I'm about as good as what I can be. <laughs> we all have areas where we know we need to grow. For some of you, it's patience. For some, it's forgiveness. For some of you, you need to find more joy in the normal rather than always looking for the exceptional, finding joy in each day. For some, it's an addiction. For some of us, maybe we've put too much focus on money or career or social status. The truth of the matter is, is that when it comes to being a work in progress, that's my story. That's your story. That's our story. And now, how does that all relate to then life as a Christian? Well, when it comes to our salvation, the amazing news of the gospel is that you have nothing you need to do. 
Your salvation is not a work in progress. Paul uses the word justification to describe what it is that God does for us. That Jesus went to the cross, he paid the punishment that we deserved for sin, and now God the Father, the the judge, he declares you and me by faith, just faith, just trusting in Jesus, he declares us not guilty. Justification is a one-time act. You cannot grow in your justification. But after that has happened, after you've become a child of God, God then gives you and me a new way to live, new purpose, new um, plans, He he gives us new ways to think about things as we follow him. And there's so many passages that talk about this, but I I love how, how Paul puts it here in 2 Corinthians when he says that Jesus died for all, that it doesn't matter how you live. No. That in response to what he's done, those who live should no longer live for themselves, but instead we live for him who died for them and was raised again. And in this living for Jesus, this growing in following him, sometimes using another theological word, we call that not justification, but the life of sanctification. And in the area of that, of walking with Christ and living out our faith, well, we're works in progress, aren't we? But I think what's really important here at the beginning of this section of Jacob is to recognize what the heart of God is for you. He is not content for us, even though we're already saved, to kind of stay where we're at in our living for Jesus or in our life of faith or sanctification. Our first fill in for today, this is God's heart. He doesn't want you to stay where you're at. He wants you to grow. That heart of God is really important to understand and know as we now transition into the next part of Jacob's life. So as we've said, we've been taking a look at this this Old Testament figure named Jacob. Uh, He lived about 1,800 years before Christ. Um, His grandfather was Abraham. His father was Isaac. And Jacob belonged to a family who, as we're coming to find out, (laughs) is not perfect in any way. But yet God chose this family to be the family who would someday give birth or that the Savior would someday come from this family. And although that was the case, what we've also found out about Jacob is that he was a deeply flawed person. His name meant heel grabber or deceiver, And we've seen in just four short weeks how he has lived up to that name. In in fact, um, the place where he's at right now in our series is all due to one of the deceptions, uh, you might recall it, where Jacob deceived his father by pretending to be his brother Esau and by then receiving a blessing that Isaac had intended for Esau. And if you recall, Esau is so angry about this that he vows to kill his brother Jacob. And so Jacob decides to flee, to run away. And as he does, like one day into the trip, he stops at a place that's come to be known as Bethel. He goes to sleep and receives a dream a dream of a stairway to heaven where there's angels going up and down, up and down from God to him and back again. And as Jacob is there, can you imagine leaving his home in such a a hurry, going someplace, Haran, where he had never been before. He's filled with likely fear and worry and a lot of guilt. God comes to him and gives him what he needs. He reminds him that although, yes, he was the cause for the problem right now, (laughs) that he had to flee, that God, first of all, promises to be with him, 
You're not going alone, Jacob. Just because you sin does not mean that I've rejected you. I still go with you. And he reestablishes the promise of a savior. I'm still going to use you and your family for the coming of the savior that you desperately need. This was exactly what Jacob needed. The right words at the right time, the right promises that he needed to hear. Have you ever you know, had a moment in your life, maybe you just had a doctor's diagnosis or someone passed away or you're going into a job interview and someone you love or someone you know had the exact words you needed to give you the confidence you needed in that moment? That is kind of what God was doing in that moment. And so the next day, with this renewed vigor, knowing that God is with him, Jacob sets off for Haran, which is no small trip, about 500 miles from Canaan, obviously on foot, right? And if you recall, there was a couple reasons why Esau, I'm sorry, Jacob was going to Haran. One is that he was going to find safety there. We talked about that. And then the other reason was, as he's on his way to Haran, The other reason was he was um, sent there to find a wife. Uh, Rebecca and Isaac, his parents, knew that it wouldn't be good for Jacob to marry a Canaanite woman. And there's a lot that could be said about that. But at the heart of it was that the the Canaanite people were not ones who followed the true God. And and Rebecca and Isaac understood that, that Jacob needed a godly wife. And so he goes to Haran looking for a wife and to find safety. And he comes across a well near Haran. There's some shepherds there. And that's where we pick it up in Genesis chapter 29. Jacob asked the shepherds, my brothers, uh, where are you from? Oh, we're from Haran, they replied. He said to them, do you know Laban, Nahor's grandson? Now, you don't know Nahor at all, but you do know Laban's relatives because Laban is the brother of Rebekah, and Rebekah, as you know, is the mother of Jacob. And so this is Uncle Laban. This is the, 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 that Jacob is asking about, the family he was supposed to go and to find. Yes, we know him, they answered. Then Jacob asked them, is he well? Yes, he is, they said, and here comes his daughter, Rachel, with the sheep. And if this was a movie, it's at this point that the director would cue the, the, the music as Rachel comes forward, probably in slow motion with the breeze flowing through her hair in just the right way. At least that's how Jacob felt, verse 10. When Jacob saw Rachel, daughter of his uncle Laban and Laban's sheep, he went over and rolled the stone away from the mouth of the well and watered his uncle's sheep. Now, it's kind of interesting, this, this moving of the stone uh, by the well was typically done by two or three different, two or three shepherds at the same time. And so I don't think it's a leap to say that um, Jacob wanted to impress this fair lady. You know how, you know, we guys feel good when we can open the pickle jar for our, uh, our wives and just kind of show off a little bit. There was some of that. There was some of that in Jacob. Look at this, Rachel. Look how strong I am. I can move this, uh, this stone from the well instantly. And we're going to see this play out. I know you don't see it in just these couple verses. We're going to see this play out instantly. Jacob had felt that he found his wife. Next verse. Then Jacob kissed Rachel. Wow, that moves quickly. <laughs> this is, um, don't try that at home, guys. Uh, this uh, is definitely not so much a romantic kiss as it is a greeting, like a traditional greeting at that time. And he began to weep aloud. Um, Jacob is weeping, not obviously because he's sad, he's weeping because of joy, uh, of He thinks he's found the person. He's found the family and now potentially a wife. Verse 12, he told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and a son of Rebekah. So she ran and told her father. And as soon as Laban, his uncle, heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he hurried to meet him. He embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his home. And there Jacob told him 
all of these things. So, God appears to a guilty, worried Jacob in Bethel. He tells Jacob, even though you've sinned, I'm with you and I'm still going to use you and your family. Go in confidence. I'm with you. Jacob goes to Haran and everything goes well. He finds the right family at the right well, and he thinks he's found the right girl. At this point in the story, everything is going well for Jacob. And you know, you have the same God who walks with you, the same power he had then, he has now, The same love he had for Jacob, he has for you. And yet, even though those things are true, if your life is anything like mine, and I know it is, not every day is a Rachel type of day. Not every day would you say, well, things are going well for me. And the truth is that this can be one of the most discouraging parts of being a Christian if you don't think about or understand what God might be or could be up to, even in our difficulties. Because if God is all-powerful and God loves me, well, then it would seem logical that things would go well for me just like they are for Jacob all the time. Why wouldn't they? He loves me. And yet, as we kind of transition here, from things going very well for Jacob and Haran to things, well, taking a little bit of a turn. I think it's good for us to remember, working into this next part, number two, that the the presence of difficulty in our lives doesn't mean the absence of God. The presence of difficulty does not mean the absence of God. And I I know that sounds so nice and what you got, preacher, and more on that. You know, like, but we're going to see this to be true as we continue here with Jacob. Verse 14, so Jacob stayed with Laban for a whole month and then his uncle said to him, "Um, you know, just because you're a relative of mine, Uh, should you work for nothing? So Jacob must have started to pitch in and to help out around the the farm. Um, Tell me what your wages should be. And Jacob's like, yeah, I know what I could ask for. Now Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah and the name of the younger was Rachel. Leah had weak eyes But Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. There is a lot written by Hebrew scholars on what the phrase weak eyes meant or delicate eyes when it comes to the the Hebrew phrase. I I am very confident that it doesn't mean that Leah didn't see as well as Rachel. Like Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had 20-20 vision. It's, It's not what's said there, is it? Even though we don't totally understand this Hebrew euphemism of having delicate or weak eyes. What we do know without a fact when you look at the comparison here is it had something to do with Leah's appearance not being as wonderful as Rachel's. Leah was not as pretty or as beautiful as Rachel was. Next verse. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, okay, here, compensation. Remember, that's what they're talking about. How about this, Laban? I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. It, it's better, Laban then said, it's better that I give her to you than to some other man. Stay here with me. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel. And, and this points to his love for her. Um, But they seemed like only a few days to him um, because of that love for her. Then, after seven years was up, Jacob said to Laban, give me my wife. My time of serving you is completed, and I want to make love to her. 
So Laban brought together all the people of the place and gave a feast. This, this feast, as I'm sure is pretty obvious, is, is one that correlates with a, a wedding, with a marriage. It's a, it's, a, it's a marriage feast, a wedding feast. And this one lasted at least a week. And during the, the course of that week, at a certain point, there would be the actual marriage ceremony and the consummating of that relationship as husband and wife would come together. Um, there's another thing about this feast that I think will play into this a little bit, is that it, it definitely was, um, well, alcohol was involved. A lot of alcohol involved. A lot of drinking. And so... The night that Jacob and Rachel were going to be able to come together for the first time as husband and wife, verse 23, when that evening came, Laban took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob, and Jacob made love to Leah. Now, you don't see it all in this verse. It'll come more clearly as we go through these other verses. But this was not something that Jacob knew that Laban had done. He slept with Leah, but he thought it was Rachel. That Laban had given Jacob his older daughter instead of the younger one. What? And maybe the first question you have is the question I have, how in all the world could that happen? Well, let's review some things. Okay, there was drinking. Lots of drinking. It was dark. And there's no electricity. The other thing that is absolutely sh true is that Leah, whether convinced by her father or eager to be a part of it, Leah was in on all of this. And so as a bride being veiled, it was not impossible for her to sort of hide her actual identity. The other question, why in all the world did this happen? Well, for that... Let's turn to Laban's words. When morning came, ever talk about a surprise in the morning? There was Leah. So Jacob said to Laban, what is this you've done to me? I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? Laban replied, well, you see, it's not our custom here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. No, no. <laughs> Maybe that was true. But if that was all that was going on here, you know what Laban could have probably done? Like, told that to Jacob seven years earlier. Like, Rachel is not available right now, not until we marry off Leah first, and then you can have her. But that really wasn't at the heart of it. Um, th there's a few scenarios here. One of them might be that, that Laban just really was worried that Leah wasn't going to find a husband, or maybe that Leah wasn't going to find a husband uh, that he liked as much as Jacob. Um, there's another potential sinister reason that Laban did this, which we'll find in the, the next verse, is that Laban may have figured out or devised a way in which he could get uh, more free labor out of Jacob. Verse 27, how about this, um, <laughs> Laban? Finish this daughter's bridal week, Jacob. Then we will give you the younger one, Rachel, also in return for another seven years of work. Now, again, there's, there is so much sin going on here, isn't there? And polygamy, which Laban is suggesting and which we see throughout the Old Testament, and actually next week we're going to see how all of that just caused lots of problems in the family, meaning the polygamy stuff. Uh, just want you to know that just because in these verses it's not clear through Moses like declaring, this was a sin, this was wrong, um, polygamy has never been God's plan. We just see this, this family in the midst of this sinful discussion, uh, dysfunction. 
and it's just got layer after layer after layer. Verse 28, and so that's what Jacob did. He finished the week with Leah, and then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel after that one week. So he didn't wait the seven years. He gave her Rachel after one week, and then also his servant Billa to his daughter Rachel as her attendant. And so then Jacob made love to Rachel also, and his love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah. This, um, this family trait of loving certain parts of the family more than others is something that Jacob would continue, not only with his wives, but as some of you know, later on with Joseph and with Benjamin, his sons as well, and just all of, again, the dysfunction that comes with not loving the way that we should. And and so he worked then for Laban another seven years. Now, as we try to digest all of this, couple questions that I I want to ask and answer. First of all, what kind of man was Laban? A deceiver, wasn't he? And some of you, because you've been here for this series, are already putting two and two together. Do you know what kind of man Laban was? He was a man like Jacob, wasn't he? You see, just seven years earlier, the reason why Jacob had to flee was that Jacob tricked his father Isaac by pretending to be the older son. And believe me, it was not something that Jacob didn't see or realize as all of this was happening, that now the shoe's on the other foot as Laban tricked his nephew Jacob by having Leah pretend to be the younger daughter. And and in this moment, and maybe you've had these experiences as well, Jacob comes to the stark realization of the hurt that he's caused. He's come to a a real-life understanding of what it's like to be on the other side of him. He's learning how sin, not following God's plan, not trusting God when he says, I'm going to give you the blessing and not Esau, what not trusting God, how that can cause lots of problems. And then here's the other question as this happens, what kind of God is God? I mean, I thought Laban, I'm sorry, Jacob had God's blessing in Bethel and that God was going to walk with him. Is now God trying to exact some sort of punishment out of Jacob for what he had done? Is this some sort of eye for an eye type of thing? No, we can't say that. God says, as far as east is from the west, so far as I removed your sin from you, not because you endure punishment, but because my son Jesus did. And yet, at the very same time, although God is not ever the author of evil, it's sin. Sin is the reason why there's evil and pain and hardship. What we do know about God is this, that we have a God, talked about this at the very beginning, who wants us to grow. And one of the things that's true for all of us, that sometimes, and God knows this, we grow more in difficulty and pain than we do when things are going wonderful and it's the right well and the right people and the right girl. God understands that in a sinful world, there is and can be blessing even in the midst of pain. And you guys, this is something that is so important for us to wrap our minds around because we've all experienced pain. Some of you are going through it right now. And I want you to know that 
something you already do know, which is that our natural reaction to pain is to remove it, to get rid of it as quickly as possible. In fact, God has even created us with um, an instinct that if you were to ever accidentally put your hand, let's say, on a hot iron or pan, you know what you don't need to do? You don't need to do this. Hmm. That seems to hurt myself a little bit. I need to remove my hand. Like, you don't even think about it, do you? You accidentally hit that pan that you didn't know was as hot as it was, and your hand just kind of jerks away. That is, well, that's a natural instinct or reaction that is conducive of how we feel about pain altogether. And so when you're and I, when we're experiencing pain, our prayers sound like this, dear Lord, remove it. Dear Lord, get rid of it. Dear Lord, why did you allow this pain to happen in the first place? And what I know that God is opening up our minds to as we see Jacob endure some some pain in this section is something we need to hear, which is number three, that God has purpose in your pain. Need to clarify again? God, being holy, is not the author of sin, He is not the author of pain because pain and hardship is the result of sin. But in his love, he will use even the pain that sin causes. And I don't always know how he will use it in every instance and circumstance. I do know this. He says, I will work all things out for the good of those who love me. Or or how about James, one of Jesus' disciples, He he writes these words in his letter uh, entitled James. He says, Consider it, my brothers and sisters, pure joy whenever you face trials, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Why? Because you know that the testing of your faith through the pain, through the hardship, it produces perseverance. When are you and I on our knees the most? Is it when things are wonderful? I hope we're on our knees thanking him, but it's amazing how when things are difficult that we are pushed on our knees when we recognize that these things are out of my hands. I need you, Lord. We see it and experience it in a different way. Let perseverance then finish its work so that you may be mature. We might grow through the trial, through the pain, and complete, not lacking anything. C.S. Lewis, that Christian author from the early um, 1900s, he put it this way in his book. He wrote, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. You know, I can understand that. At the same time, I'm, I don't know that I'm quite where James was at, where, you know, pure joy that I'm experiencing hardship and pain. I, I, know, that, I know that my prayers don't reflect this. Uh, God, send me some pain. I want to grow, so please send some hardship into my life right now. I'm guessing your prayers don't reflect that either. And if you're praying that God would remove the pain in your life, the hardship, the trial, the difficulty, that's a good prayer. You can pray it. You can bring anything to him that you're feeling. But I I do think that as we recognize that God can even use the pain, the hardship, the trial, it brings new purpose to what otherwise might seem, well, like there is none. And when there's purpose to pain, it's a little easier to endure. You know, having surgery typically makes things more painful in the short term, usually. But we're okay with that. Why? Because we know that short-term pain will produce long-term blessing. And we have a God who does the same thing. Now, 
there are no heroes in this account once again. We got a lot of dysfunction, a lot of sin going on. But there is a hero that continually lurks throughout not only these pages, but all of Scripture. It's the reason why it was all written. It's the son that came from that family. And it's amazing how different he was. In fact, number four, we'd rather avoid pain. (laughs) Jesus chose pain. We'd rather stay away from the things that cause us hardship and difficulty. Jesus loved you so much that he chose the harder route, the more painful way. Jesus chose the cross and suffered hell, even though he didn't have to, because he loves you. I was listening to a pastor recently uh, describe something that happened to him um, when his daughter was two years old. Um, he was sleeping soundly when all of a sudden through the, um, the baby monitor, he started to hear some groaning and it woke him up and he went to his daughter's room and as he opened the door, first thing he noticed was smell. Um, it was the throw up kind of smell. As he turned on the light, he describes how he saw his daughter crying, tears in her eyes, and there's like puke everywhere all over her. Now, before you become a parent, what you realize in a moment like that is you need to find someone else to go and help. (laughs) When you become a parent, you realize, I'm someone else. And so he went over to his daughter, and she just looked so sad and worried in this mess that she made. And he describes how in that moment he, um, well, he chose to go in her mess. He chose not just to pick her up like this, but chose puke and all to pull her tight. Come here. I know you've made a mess, but I love you. Come here. And he carried her to the shower and washed her up. I thought, you know what? (laughs) That's what God's done for us. Jacob made his own mess. We do too. And while we learn from it, at the very same time, Jesus has paid for it. And he looks at us in our mess and he hopes we learn something. But more than that, He's telling you today, come here. I love you. I'm not afraid of your mess. I came to die for it. And I've washed you off through the blood of my son. So, guys, trust him. Trust him when things are going great and you're at the right well with the right people, with the right Rachel heading your way but trust him in the pain and know that he loves you in both. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we we thank you for um, your love and uh, you know, Lord, as we do, how desperately we need it. We are a mess. We make messes. And Lord, thank you for teaching us through the pain and difficulty that can come out of that. But more today, even more than that, Lord, we thank you that those messes do not, do not cause any problems between us, you and I, you and us, because Jesus came to pay for the messes. We thank you, Lord, and and pray that we go from today, no matter what our life is like today, with a renewed trust and renewed trust in your grace and your direction. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.